The idea of life after death has been debated for centuries. There are those who believe that the dead can return to this world and communicate with the living. And then there are those who believe in a more scientific explanation to ghost stories and encounters. Because of this, I have made it my mission to research paranormal occurrences. Many people think of ghost stories as an outdated tradition, reserved only for campfires and fictional books. But there are real stories, from real places and real people. What happens when these formerly fictional stories come to life in front of our eyes? You don't have to travel far from Pittsburgh to find one of the most haunted places in America. Just 45 minutes north of the city in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, sits Hillview Manor, a poor farm turned nursing home with a dark and mysterious past. The facility opened its doors in 1926 as the Lawrence County home for the aged. This facility housed the mentally ill, destitute, and elderly residents with no place to go. Records suggest that it probably wasn't such a very great place to be. We noticed that, oh, they came in to the poor farm and then a couple days later died from a fractured skull, which is very odd. Most of the time, those who died in the poor farm were buried in a small cemetery behind the building. This area is now a golf course that sits on the graves of the unfortunate inmates who died in the poor house. In 1977, after over 50 years as a poor farm, the facility was changed to Hillview Manor, an extended care facility. For the last three decades, Hillview Manor was open. Thousands of people spent the last years of their lives in these rooms and hallways. I would say that what we've gathered from the last probably two year, two years of records and multiply that by the time from the building was open till it closed. We are guessing between eight to 12,000 people that have died in the building. With that many deaths in one building, it isn't hard for many people to believe that Hillview Manor is a catalyst for paranormal activity. Okay, TR, we are standing in front of the boiler room and there is a story of a resident actually dying down here named Eli Sari. Who was Eli and how did he actually die down here? Uh, Eli was a resident here. Um, he came here in the early 1930s. He lost his home due to being an alcoholic. Uh, Christmas Eve 1934, he decided to go out and get drunk. You weren't allowed to be drunk on the premises. Um, a couple of his friends found him passed out back in the snow, brought him down here in the boiler room to sleep it off. When they came back the next morning, they found him dead of intoxication. Now, you actually believe you've come in contact with Eli. Yes. Down here in the boiler room, what experience did you have and how did it affect you? We were down here doing an investigation. Um, it was me and two other people. And from the back corner of the boiler room, we heard footsteps running towards us and stopped probably about a foot to two feet in front of us, just dead stop. What was your first thought? What was the first thought that ran through your head whenever you heard this? Um, my first thought was get the hell out of there. Um, but then, you know, being a rational person, you try and find some kind of explanation I thought maybe an animal had gotten in, went searching everywhere to try and find an animal, couldn't even find a footstep of an animal down there, and could not find an explanation. In these end-of-life care facilities, sadness becomes a very familiar emotion. Sometimes the sadness of dying can be too much for one person to bear. Why do you think that this hallway is more active than other areas? Uh, I think it's because it was like a hospice wing. Um, it was a critical care unit for a while, so there was probably a high turnover rate of people in right. this room. Plus, we also have a man that hung himself back in the 1930s by the name of Angelo, and we get a lot of activity from him. We've asked him, you know, his name, and it's not just what happened to them here either, the reason they were here, you right. know, the whole, their whole lives might have been really difficult and hard, you know, to deal with, and they come here and then either they pass away or, their energies left behind, I don't know, but yeah. No one can know why those who died at Hillview Manor can still be heard from in these rooms and halls to this day. Maybe they liked it here. 
maybe they think they're stuck here. Maybe it's their own personal hell. I don't know because I know I wouldn't want to have to be stuck in one place. I'm hoping that they have the ability to come and go as they please. Hillview Manor is a building that had a profound effect on its community and those who died within its walls. It is ironic that those who died here now have a profound effect on all who enter. Sitting just 40 miles west of Pittsburgh is the small and quiet town of East Liverpool, Ohio. Right in the middle of this little city is the J.C. Thompson building. The building itself was built in 1889 and there was a fire that destroyed the entire city block in 1909. Uh, during that fire that was um, documented the first confirmed death in the building. Um, right after the fire was put out, they're not sure if he was looting or if he was actually helping, um, but Bert Sweargarden was crushed by the wall of the Thompson building uh, fell into the basement. They said his face and his head was crushed from, from that. What many people don't know is that the J.C. Thompson building has a mysterious past. The rumors are that this area was a brothel. I have found some historical documents stating that there was a brothel up and running in this area and it gives the location of where the building is. Any building that was once surrounded by illegal activities is bound to have some unexplained history. And it isn't surprising that the J.C. Thompson building has many stories of paranormal activity. Well, we were having an investigation and we had a, we had a group of people all crowded in here. And uh, I was on my knee right here in the corner and I happened to look up and in the corner, in this doorway right here, there was a there was a full-bodied apparition. There was a woman, and she was leaning out of the doorway, and she was looking right at me. You think that this woman could be maybe the spirit of a prostitute or a woman who worked up here? That could very well be. I mean, you know, uh, I was really surprised. I mean, shocked is more like the word because I I normally don't see stuff like that. You know, I mean, who does? Right. And I looked up and. There she was, and she was staring at me just, just as much as I was staring at her. Paranormal experiences that connect directly to the history of the building are very compelling. As I continue to ask questions, it turns out Mike isn't the only person who has seen this woman. Um, last year, I was locking up after an investigation. I was down on the diamond, and we were just building our website, so I was taking pictures of the outside of the building in the dark. Um, I took one picture with my cell phone and I looked and I could see something in the window. So I zoomed in and it looked like a full figure woman, uh, Victorian dress, uh, long sleeved high neck with a Victorian hairstyle standing off to the side. And being who I am, I took a step back and uh, took another picture of the same window to see if there was debris hanging down or if it was just a trick, but there's no debris in the window, there's nothing hanging from the ceilings, no curtains. Wow. So. Wow, that is amazing. Now, who do you think this woman might be? Well, there's been rumors that this was a brothel, so we feel that it's probably one of the ladies of the night, and they've had conversation with them as well in different areas of the building. But I've also found um, in some historical documents from East Liverpool where a gentleman was running a brothel on um, Market and Six, which is the location of this building. Could Sarah have captured a picture of an apparition of one of the prostitutes who used to work in this brothel? Paranormal evidence that is this compelling really makes you start to wonder. What other experiences are people having in this building? There was one group who as they were packing up for the night and I was escorting them out, they were, you know, talking and, and um, on their EVP they were, you know, saying goodbye to the building. The lady says, you know, is there somebody who could say hello, goodbye or something to us? And plain as day a voice comes over and says, hi Sarah, which is my name. 
hello or goodbye or something to us. With the shadowy history behind the J.C. Thompson building, it doesn't come as a surprise to find out that there are so many ghost stories. The J.C. Thompson building is riddled with a dark past that may have taken the lives of those who dared to enter. And it appears that those who died here have no plans of leaving anytime soon. When former county commissioner Bob Cranmer and his young family began to look for a home near Pittsburgh in the small and quiet town of Brentwood, one house stood out above the rest. I grew up in this little town here, Brentwood. <clears throat> I was always attracted to this house from the time I, my earliest memories. So my expectation was I was buying a really neat house that I had always admired, I had always wanted to see and to walk through and that it was gonna be a great place to live. And we certainly had no idea whatsoever what was gonna come along with the house. In hindsight, all of the signs of a haunting were there, even before they made an offer on the home. Well, I, I would say that the day we were looking at the house, um, or one of the times we were looking at the house, um, our, our um, three-year-old son wandered off by himself. Uh, they found him on a landing halfway up the staircase, hyperventilating and crying. It, it was um, somewhat uh, telling that the woman, as she ran up to him in front of my wife to embrace him, asked him, did you see something? At the time, Bob didn't see the significance of this strange occurrence and made a lowball offer on his dream home. To his shock, his offer was accepted almost immediately. It was as if the seller was running away from the house as fast as they could. And shortly after moving in, strange things began to happen. Uh, he'd come down in the morning and all the lights would be on in the first floor. Radio would be playing, water would be running, things like that. So but the strangest of the early activity came from a coat closet under the main staircase. That coat closet has a light in it and there's a brass pull chain on it. You reach in, pull the chain, turn on the light. And I noticed after probably three times in a row as I would either be going to the closet to get my overcoat or to hang it back up again, that chain would not be hanging straight but would be wrapped around the little screws that held in the crystal shade. Uh, you know, I automatically thought, well, it's not the children, so I automatically thought it was my wife. So, so then one morning I went, got my coat, turned it on, we were both there. Uh, she saw me turn the light off, the chain was hanging, closed the door, I said, okay, don't go in the closet the rest of the day. I came home, right to the closet, she came with me, opened the door, chains wrapped around the light. Wow. Now, with that, we knew, right then, there's something going on here. This activity seemed harmless at first, but this family would soon come to find out that this was not a friendly spirit. As, as the time went on, this thing really unmasked itself for what it was, and that wasn't a harmless, you know, formerly human spirit, it was a demonic entity that was evil and was out to hurt us um, and uh, wanted to drive us out of this house. As the activity became worse, the Cranmer family looked to the Catholic Church for help. Now once the church did get involved, did things get better or did they get worse? Oh, uh, they got much worse it would make this thing angry. And subsequently, in days after they were there, it would move furniture around the house, it would turn pictures sideways, it would take pictures off the wall, it would make it known that it, it was still here and it wasn't happy. The strangest and most unexplained piece of activity reported by Bob and his family emerged in 2005. 
Suddenly, a strange, red, blood-like substance materialized on the walls. And this appeared all over your house, not just in one and room? Initially, it began in January of 2005 on the third floor. And over the next few weeks, appeared on the second floor, down the stairway right behind me, um, up here on this stairway. We didn't have all the artwork there then. Um, and then eventually down to the first floor and even appeared on the kitchen cabinets. Wow. I kept a number of um, sheets of the wallpaper that actually had the uh, blood-like substance running down it. You can see where the yeah. drops would have hit the walls. That just showed then, up on the and wall? And then subsequently ran ran down the walls. There's. And you had this tested? I've had, had this, I've had this, this, I had the fluid analyzed by two different laboratories. Um, they didn't know what it was, uh, and they certainly had no idea how it would have appeared on our walls in, in drops. After the church became involved, Bob and his family began to find religious artifacts, crosses and crucifixes, bent and broken in half. And then suddenly, this spirit began to physically harm the family. Uh, it would bite us, it would scratch us, particularly scratch us, it would scratch me a lot. Scratch my chest, scratch my back, scratch my arms. Uh, generally always three parallel scratches um, that, that would go down uh, underneath your clothing. With all of this frightening phenomena occurring, the church decided that this house might be in need of an exorcism. A team of paranormal investigators was brought in from State College, Pennsylvania. Before they came to conduct their research, a psychic told them of a crawl space in the center of the house that would need to be accessed. So when they came um, the next morning, they came a Friday night, and they asked me if such a place existed. And I right away knew that it did, right in the center of the house, uh, there's a large area underneath this large staircase behind that walk-in closet. This is the same walk-in closet where the activity began with the brass pull chain. When the team arrived, they knew they had to cut through the back wall of the closet. Once open, in this crawl space, they found personal items from the Cranmer family. We found a piece of my, a Lego, a Lego toy from my, I, from my son. I mean, now how a Lego toy got in that space, that I mean was completely sealed off. There was no access to it. The air that came out was stale, but they found a Lego toy in there. Uh, but, I, you know, certainly the most interesting thing that they found was a crumbled up picture. The drawing that was found was a sketch of the original owner of the house and his mother. On the reverse side of this picture, uh, the only thing, it, it, it just looked evil. Now, as we later found out, th there were, you know, European traditions on how to put a curse on a place or a family or a person, and that's most likely what all those kind of demented drawings were about. After finding these drawings and removing them from the house, the church came in and cast the demon from the home. This family's nightmare was finally over. After experiencing this real life horror story, Bob was inspired to write a book called The Demon of Brownsville Road, where he documents from beginning to end his family's experience with this demonic entity. There is one reason and one reason alone as to why Cranmer continues to tell this story. Well, <clears throat> because evil is real. And as I say, telling this story, writing this book, which is, a, which is a, I think it's probably one of the most well-documented, well-researched, uh, most thoroughly told and explained story of the paranormal, supernatural, the demonic, that exists um, and it unmasks evil for what it is. It demonstrates that evil does exist. 
Bob Cranmer's story echoes a fear that resonates deep within everyone's mind. What would you do if you and your family came under attack from an invisible force? How would you survive the terror that lurks in the dark, just out of sight? Science still sits years away from understanding ghosts and the paranormal. Because of this, many people refuse to believe that there is more to life than our eyes can see. But there are those who have experience that points towards a more mysterious truth. These stories told by real people get us no closer to finding the answers. But if our minds are kept open to the possibility, maybe the answers will find us. Mm -hmm.